العافيه وياكم اخوكم ام دكتور محمد الرشيدي ريجنال دايركتور فروانيا هوسبيتال اي واز فيري لاكي ذات وي ستارت ذس بروجكت ان 2016 ذس از ذا فيرست تايم اي جوينت فروانيا ون اوف ذا ميتينج ان ريسك مانجمنت ذا ريز ذا ايشو اوف في تي اي بروفلاكسس يو نو دكتورز ذي لاف ستاتستكس They love to put guidelines. It's all in their heads, but sometimes they have difficulty in applying it. Okay, uh, you have to change the way you think of the meeting, and to ha you have to nudge the people in the meeting, and you have to bring bring them closer together. Farwani Hospital is a secondary hospital. We have different sectors. We have obstetric. We have surgical, we have pediatric, we have medical, we have orthopedic. We have full-fledged of subspecialties. So it's a bit difficult. You know, they say pre, uh, diagnosis need intelligence, but treatment need an art. But they'll change it a bit, and they'll say that management need an art. You have to bring people together, and you, ha you have to write, you, you have to ask the for your team. Uh, I always ask them if you can prevent an injury or a harm or prevent morbidity or mortality for one patient, will you refuse? Everybody will say what? No. I shall be more aggressive. I'll do my best. So I want to change them to be that in their creed. Uh, we try to do the best thing. In 2016, this uh, VTE prophylaxis wasn't ROG, ROB in uh, accreditation. They changed it in 2019. But we started earlier on. We want, you know, it's very difficult and dynamic. It's a complex problem. It's involved the patient, involved multiple uh, sector of the healthcare provider, administration, uh, recording, capturing data. It's diverse and complex. And if you don't put a smart interventions and engage people, you won't succeed. So it's started from scratch. Then it changed. Then we raise it. And each meeting, we shall ask the same question. If you can prevent harm and death to your patient. Will you refuse? This question, we ask it every time. And what shall we do better? Is paper form is good? It's good. Compliance is good? Not that good. Difficult to calculate. Doesn't help or aid the clinician. What shall we use? Cabrini. RSOG, uh, uh, NICE, it's quite diverse. What remit shall we use? Do we need to involve pharmacy? Do we need to involve pediatric? Because they are outskirters. Do, you know, do we need to involve nursing? Changing everything. You, even you have to change the structure. Do we involve a physical, uh, physiotherapy? You have to ask the right question. Who shall I involve? involve and you have to change the creed and the <clears throat> mission for each individual and you have to translate it in a very simple human being need this is how we sh shall do it you know once we graduate from medical school we have an oath And what the oath say? This. First, do no harm. Once the patient enter the hospital or enter your clinic, you should do no harm. Why? He came to you. He came for an advice. He came for a treatment. You should supply an excellent treatment, a comprehensive treatment. You have 
to show him, lead him the way. I'd love to involve patient in our meeting, but still we are not in a quite culturally acceptable way. But with time, we will change the behavior of the organization and change the behavior of your client. Because as an administration, I have two clients. I have the patient and as well the worker. I have to meet their need. How can I make life for them easy? I should use electronic medical record. I should use clinical assistant software. So I'll show them what is the best practice and leave it for them. For this guideline, you should use intermediate low molecular weight. Calculate the risk of bleeding. I nudge them. BMI, you don't calculate. You put it, it will be there for you, and then you will follow up. I don't want to have mistakes. We have two clients, and even among clients, different treatment will vary. I remember in pediatrics, we asked, it's very low risk, what shall we do? Maybe we involve physiotherapy. It's a smart way to move. Physical assi assisted uh, instrument that will help for people with high risk. But I need to highlight. I need to capture the data. If we want to apply it in Kuwait or change the guideline in Kuwait, we have to have a strong data. Unfortunately, we give treatment. It's single isolated islands, but we want more wealth of data. We thought of revising every uh, NGO done for sudden death, so we we'll revise because we want to measure the outcome. How can we measure the outcome? We have to have a certain highlight how many patients died and uh, angio done for them and showed balmorinal embolism, DVT, Doppler. So that's why, and I'm, I'm sure you'll be happy because today the team will talk and I would like to thank each one of them from the small or the frontline employer till the head of the department. And we had the alliance of other non-profit uh, organization as well as some companies. They help us develop the software in the medical record as well as uh, get, generating the data. So, Dr. Alamia, Abdul Jawad shall join now and continue the presentation. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Lamia, quality and accreditation physician. Also, I'm a consulting team member for providing quality and accreditation program in Farwania Hospital. Before I will start, just I want to explain that our lecture today will focus on the method of implementing VTE program, rather than focusing on the result of the pre and post intervention. We will start with the quality improvement framework. In 2016, once the leadership commitment is approved, the head of the hematology unit, Dr. Mohammed Al Mahmid, and the quality office decided to design a framework. This framework is formed of four stages. The first stage is review the actual practice and design the plan. The second one is introducing the multifaceted interventions. And the third is monitor and refine the process, while the fourth is sustain and spread. The following table showing the time period for each step to be implemented. Each step varied for the implementation from six months to one year. And you will see here, you will see here at the stage three and the stage four, once they started, they are still ongoing. In each stage, there is steps. As regards to stage number one, the first step was doing baseline audit for the medical and surgical department, which revealed that 
45% of high-risk patients receive the appropriate prophylaxis. However, these, uh, this was not documented in a risk assessment form. Further analysis and dissemination of the result to gain more support is done, to gain more support from the leadership and the related head of the department. And this helped to embed the program into the strategic plan to be one of the initiatives in the strategic plan for the years 2016 to 2019. The initial goal was more than 90% who will be hospitalized will receive the appropriate prophylaxis. Going to stage two, which is introducing multifaceted intervention, we started by formulating a multidisciplinary team, including clinical department representative, along with clinical pharmacists and physiotherapy department representatives. The team worked on distillation of best practices and transferred into local VTE protocols. Then prepared a manual or paper-based VTE risk and admission orders. In 2017, DVT Safe Zone is released by the hospital and this empowered the preparation of standardized protocol and assessment for, for medical, surgical, and ob -gyne. After that, the idea of shifting from paper-based to electronic to electronic is adopted by the administration and including information management representative uh, to, to implement the program is added. And they do, um, they confer, they, sorry, uh, they transfer the paper-based forms and the admission orders into electronic one as Dr. Ali, inshallah, will show in, in the upcoming slides. Robust education for the staff in many forms are done in the form of lectures, videos, and focus group discussion with frontliner support. Going to the third stage, which is monitoring and refining the process and the program, we feel that we need a set of metrics which include process and outcome measures, and we design a whole process mapping of the process starting from the admission, passing to the transfer, then ending by the discharge of the patient. Some augmenting intervention are also needed, like mandating the use of the VTE risk assessment to be filled by the related physician within 24 hours of admission. And also, reminders on the system are done by the engineering, the IT engineering. Regular meeting of the multidisciplinary team also was regular, and there was patient engagement in the World Thrombosis Day in 2019. Landing to stage four, which is sustain and spread. We reached our target, but we need the sustainability as regard the process measures of proper prophylaxis of VTE within 24 hours and proper assessment. Also, the program succeeded in Decreasing the mortality rate as regard outcome measures from 19, from 19 cases to 12 cases. 12 cases died in, from PE in 2016, and they are decreased in 212 in 2022. Although it is rough data, but it needs more um, dragging and more digging to clarify what are the associated factors. Coming to the engagement. Upcoming event for engaging the staff and the patient are upcoming and further refine will be done. Thank you. Now I will give the mic to Dr. Ali just to clarify the clinical perspective of the journey. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I don't know if my, my voice is clear or not. So uh, I am Dr. Ali Drewi. I am hematology specialist working for Rani Hospital. Uh, sorry for the delay for technical issues. Uh, today I will take you through our journey in Farwani Hospital uh, in DVT uh, prophylaxis. Uh, starting with the short introduction, then we'll go through the journey. So why, why thromboprophylaxis? Uh, as you know, 60% of all venous thromboembolism is hospital acquired. And PE is 
so we can prevent it. In terms of mortality uh, and morbidity uh, in the form of post-thrombotic syndrome, uh, pulmonary hypertension, post -E, bleeding, once the patient diagnosed with DVT and requires anticoagulation, which may create again a longer length of stay and also readmission to the hospital uh, having a load or uh, cost on the uh, healthcare system. Hospital acquired VT uh, can be prevented effectively, safely, and inexpensively. And thromboprophylaxis is ranked one of the uh, top patient safety strategy in hospitalized patients. Uh, this uh, study shows that uh, the risk of DVT without having prophylaxis uh, ranges from 10% in patients up to 80% in orthopedic and trauma patients. So what, I, what evidence we have for thromboprophylaxis? It has been shown that it's reduced including weight through uh, Ministry of Health. <coughs> uh, so it always starts with assessing the risk of VTE on admission. And for patients with high uh, risk of thrombosis, uh, should be started with appropriate prophylaxis. And what is, what is the definition of pro appropriate prophylaxis? Is to give the correct dose according to the weight and creatinine clearance within 12 to 24 hours of admission or surgery, or to give mechanical prophylaxis if the patient is at high risk of bleeding, to restart anticoagulant once there is no bleeding uh, risk, and to consider post-discharge prophylaxis for, like for example, for orthopedic patients. Multiple uh, uh, team workers, so including uh, nursing staff, one from, uh, one head nurse from each ward, Doctors, one doctor from each unit, uh, pharmacist, uh, clinical pharmacist involving, involved with the, uh, in the rounding, physiotherapist also to, uh, to provide uh, good education about uh, mobilizing the patient. Radiology department were also involved to, uh, to give us the uh, new cases for the future to, to, uh, to do the root, root cause analysis. And also, of course, the quality department was supporting us. So the patient education leaf, uh, leaflet uh, was also distributed for patients, which was also printed uh, form, and it was given to the patients on admission. And an adult followed that, and uh, this is the result showing 71% of patients had a risk assessment done. So, so the risk assessment increased from none to 59 to 71%. And the percentage of high-risk patients receiving prophylaxis appropriately within 24 hours was 84%. <clears throat> In 2018, to further increase the compliance and to decrease the human errors and decrease the load on the team members, we further uh, updated our program. Uh, so our paper-based mandatory admission orders, we changed it to an electronic risk assessment through the HIS system. Uh, the human alerts, we changed it to an electronic alerts where a forced st uh, stop of function in the system if the form is not done. Uh, staff education uh, started with a mandatory lecture attendance with a short video explaining how to fill the DVT form. The paper-based uh, patient education uh, we started to use a QR code on admission, and also we, uh, we had a, pa a patient awareness day for that. Paper-based audit forms, we changed it to a mobile-based uh, audit form uh, to make it easier for doctors to uh, go through the audit. And root cause analysis, we use an easier search method through our radiology department. Plus, our VTE committee team and hospital uh, policy uh, continued, and our frontline team uh, working on that. This is uh, an example of the electronic risk assessment form. Uh, this uh, this two, two sections, two pages uh, through the HIS, and this is an example from the Caprini risk assessment. 
uh, on the first screen, the, the doctor can uh, fill the uh, thrombosis risk uh, factors, bleeding risk factors, and uh, contraindications to mechanical uh, compression. And here we made some, we made it user friendly, where we collected all the risk factors, uh, categorized it together instead of being scattered. If you if you look into Caprini score, it is scattered through according to the uh, severity points. Here we put them all the uh, into categories. For example. The doctor can choose the, uh, the severity of uh, surgery. They are all put together. And on the right side, if you can see, the risk score will be calculated automatically through the HIS. And this uh, section also includes uh, a calculator for BMI. So just you put the weight height, BMI will be calculated automatically. On the second page, uh, the doctor can choose the thromboprophylaxis options and the, uh, the risk factors for bleeding. And also we have another calculator for creatinine clearance. The doctor can put the creatinine according to the BMI weight, the creatinine clearance will be calculated. Uh, and also through the HIS, it can get the last creatinine done in the previous like 30 days. It will be automatically there. So it, it is being easier for the staff to use it. Our frontline team consisted of one doctor from each treating unit in all departments, including 10 doctors from medical department, four from surgical, five from gynae, and one from each ICU, CCU, ortho, vascular, plastic, and uh, urology departments. Their role is to ensure that their, uh, their own team is on track with us uh, in terms of education and appropriate uh, implementation of risk assessment. And the DVT committee a uh, member communicates with the frontline uh, team through WhatsApp. Uh, and the aim of this method is to ensure an easy and quick communication for sharing educational uh, materials and actively solving issues if they arise. Uh, staff uh, education, uh, we had a mandatory attendance of lectures about VTE prevention, which was periodic, almost two weeks a month. Uh, which is required for all uh, hospital staff throughout the year. Uh, and it was as part of comprehensive training of the hospital and part of hospital orientation program for new staff. Attendees also receive certificate of attendance after successfully completing a quiz, a quiz assessing their knowledge. Also, a short video is distributed periodically through WhatsApp uh, to all physicians explaining how to appropriately fill the electronic risk assessment form, as you see in the picture here. Patient engagement, as I mentioned earlier, uh, patients were provide, are provided with a QR code to be scanned on admission, uh, and it, con it contains information about hospital acquired thrombosis and prevention, and we provided them available in four languages. And Thrombosis Awareness Day, as I mentioned earlier, we had it in 2019. This is a picture uh, of the day. Uh, we had it along with the International uh, World Thrombosis Day, which is uh, done in October each year. And uh, regarding the audit tool, we used, as mentioned, we, use, we, we are using now an electronic mobile-based audit tool, uh, which has been developed by our quality department. Uh, which is used by the auditors through their mobile phones. So through my mobile phone, I can go through the cases, I put all the data there and it will go directly. Uh, the, su the submitted data is collected automatically uh, in Excel table and uh, graphs for a quick analysis and any intervention if required. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of how the results are becoming uh, after we, uh, we, we insert, our, we put our data. Uh, it's coming, uh, we can check the uh, cause of the uh, thrombosis patients having and also the diagnosis. And also as mentioned by Dr. Alamia, the process mapping of uh, VTE prophylaxis, we are following this mapping uh, from admission uh, we need to assess the patient risk and all, and also during hospitalization, and also on discharge, we don't leave the patient unless we uh, assess him again if he needs an extended prophylaxis. So, uh, what are our future plans? We are still in the process of measuring the rate of appropriate prophylaxis in all departments, 
And as mentioned earlier, our goal is to exceed 90%, inshallah. Uh, also, uh, measuring VTE incidence, mortality, bleeding, and hit, comparing uh, the results now to back to 2015, and to publish a VTE registry and farwaniya practice. Our future strategies to improve pay, uh, physicians' compliance and monitoring, uh, a real-time dash, dashboard screen will be used to, uh, to help identify under and over prophylaxis and actively intervene if needed. A daily electronic reminders uh, for the doctors to reassess the possibility uh, of restarting anticoagulation for patients on mechanical prophylaxis due to the risk of bleeding. And finally, uh, we, are we are working on a DVT prophylaxis protocol for orthopedic outpatients uh, with Im immobilization and casts to provide the proper uh, thromboprophylaxis easing, even in our outpatients. These are our references. Thank you for your attention. And I will leave you with the, uh, with the uh, video for our education of our staff. And thank you for Welcome to the Farwaniya Hospital VTE Risk Assessment Tool for Surgical Patients. In this orientation video, you will learn how to identify patients at risk of venous thromboembolism and apply appropriate management plan using the HIS system in Farwaniya Hospital. When should VTE risk assessment be performed to, to surgical patients? It should be performed immediately after admission for all patients, after the transfer between wards, and whenever there is a change in the patient's clinical status. Please note, patients admitted under surgery who are on conservative treatment, i.e. not undergoing surgery, should also be assessed. There are two ways to access the tool. The first one is in the patient list using the DVT column on the far right side of the page. Simply click on your patient's square and it will take you directly to the tool. A red square means that the DVT assessment has been done, whereas a green box means that the DVT has not yet been recorded. The other way is in the patient's personal page under special forms, DVT, DVT surgical. This is how the first page looks in the, in the, tool, in the tool. Please fill in the data, including the age, the mobility factors, BMI, type of surgery, venous disease or clotting disorder factors, other history factors, as well as a section for women only. Please note that there is a tool uh, on the right upper side to, to measure the BMI of the patients. Once you've completed the data, the score will be automatically recorded. And then the next step would be to go to the second page. The second page, the score will, will be recorded as well, and the risk will be identified and the recommendation given automatically. For, in this example, the risk score is 4, which is moderate VTE risk, and the recommendation is pharmacological prophylaxis. You can choose the prophylaxis here depending on the patient's weight as well as creatinine clearance. Please note that there is a serum creatine clearance measurement tool on the right upper side. You can also pick, on, pick mechanical compression or no prophylaxis. For your convenience, there is also a contraindication list for mechanical um, compression. Once you click it, a list will be shown to you for your benefit. Finally, you have to also tick in the boxes for the risk factors of bleeding. And finally, click on save. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Amel. I am a consultant of obstetrics and gynecology, and I am a maternal fetal medicine specialist in Farwania Hospital. Currently, I am the head of obstetric and gynecology department in Farwania. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be here today, and I would like uh, to thank the organizing committee for this kind invitation 
Today I will present obstetrics and gynecology best practices for VTE prophylaxis. So the outlines of my lecture, I will start with a brief introduction about the prevalence and pathogenesis of venous thrombombolism in obstetrics. Then I will highlight the risk factors for VTE in obstetrics and gynecology. Then I will share with you our VTE risk scoring system in ob department in Farwania Hospital. And I will uh, highlight the department guidelines that we are doing in Farwania Hospital. I will end my presentation with a recommendation and a conclusion. So, venous thrombombolism. It's a serious medical condition with high mortality. But is it preventable? According to the EMBRACE and the CMAC, which is the national audit program in the United Kingdom investigating the maternal deaths, infant deaths, and the stillbirths, the last report in 2018 to 2020 stated that VTE is the third leading cause of maternal death. And VTE is account for 1.1 deaths per 100,000 deliveries. So thrombosis and thrombombolism continue to be the leading cause of direct deaths occurring within 42 days of the end of the pregnancy. The RCOG stated that incidence of VTE in a pregnancy and postpartum is 107 per 100,000 person years in the United Kingdom. CDC cleared that the number of people affected per year, 900,000 people at risk of having VTE. And the sudden death is the first symptoms of pulmonary embolism. So what do we need to do as a clinician? We need to save lives. How we do that? Identifying the person at risk and act promptly. What I do as a obstetricians and gynecology, I would like to save women life. We usually uh, knew that obstetrics is a beautiful journey, which is pregnancy and postpartum is a very beautiful event to the women. I need to save the woman's life to enjoy her pregnancy and her childbirth. So what I have to do, I will need to prevent VTE in those uh, women. So let's briefly discuss about the prevalence of VTE in obstetrics. As mentioned earlier by my colleagues, the overall risk is one, in, uh, one to two per thousand. And the antenatal risk of VTE is about five times higher compared to an unpregnant. Postpartum is again is fivefold higher compared to antenatal and 60 times higher compared to an unpregnant. And the majority of pulmonary embolism occurred postnatal period. So 75 to 80% of pregnancy associated VTE is DVT, and 20 to 25% is pulmonary embolism. 50% of thrombosis occurred antenatally, and 50% occurred postnatally. Usually, 83% of, uh, of women who died during or up to six weeks after pregnancy, they do have a risk factors. So, venous thrombombolism risk account for 50% during antenatal period, which is higher in the third trimester, and that's explained by the enlarged uterus that causing compression to the large veins. Postpartum, which has occurred for 50%. So we need to do an action. So uh, 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 major delineations about the pathogenesis of thrombosis in pregnancy uh, stated that this uh, varicose uh, triad, which is, consists of venous stasis, endothelial injury, and a hypercoagulable state. Uh, just to summarize, venous stasis that's related to the alterations to the blood flow in the lower extremities due to compressions of the large veins. Although 
the venous return and total blood is increased during the pregnancy. However, the blood velocity to the lower extremities is reduced because of the pregnancy-induced hormones caused dilatation and capacitance of the uh, veins and makes the venous pooling and the valvular incompetence, and that increases the risk of uh, uh, VTE. Endothelial injury. Vascular injury delivery is associated with vascular injury and alteration to the uteroplacental surface. Operative deliveries such as instrumental deliveries, uh, vacuum deliveries, and caesarean deliveries that cause exacerbatings of the vascular intimal injury, and that's really one of the major causes of the uh, pathogenesis of the thrombosis. We already knew that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. So there is increased uh, number of the coagulation factors and you reduce the fibrinolytic uh, activities. So in general, antenatal and postpartum are marked uh, 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 periods for uh, uh, the, the presence of the three features of the Vercos uh, triad, so making the pregnancy and the postpartum period a very high uh, risk for developing VTE. So uh, what happened, what uh, the worldwide was doing, the Our Royal College produced an excellent guidelines about reducing the risk of VTE during the pregnancy and postpartum. They identified the patient at risk and categorized them into high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk. That's based on the presence of any uh, uh, factors. So they decided that there is a pre-existing uh, uh, factors which is is already there in patients, and that's why we can highlight it through the history taking. <clears throat> Obstetrics risk factors, that's the uh, risk factors that occur during the pregnancy, whether like patients is pregnant with a multiple pregnancy or she got a, a, a complication during the pregnancy like a, a preeclampsia. And also, if she got an operative delivery, such as a cesarean section. So those are the risk factors related to the obstetrics. And there are some transient factors, which is temporarily, and they, have, they are only available at a short time. So we call it the transient risk factors. So VTE risk assessment, we classify the risk based on the patient risk factors into high and intermediate and low risk. And this is the antenatal assessment management uh, by the RCOG, which categorize the patient at high risk or intermediate risk or at lower risk. And what we need to do for those patients. Patients with high risk of VTE, patients require a thromboprophylaxis immediately once uh, 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 discovered that she's a high risk and continue throughout the pregnancy. And if the patient is noticed that to be an intermediate risk, she needs a thromboprophylaxis from 28 weeks onward. But if she's at lower risk, we encourage the mechanical thromboprophylaxis like early ambulations, elastic compression strokings. With all these, we need to educate patient. I do really agree with Dr. Najat earlier when she said patient education is a must. Patient should be on board while we are talking about the management plan. Again, postnatal assessment, the, the RCOG, uh, uh, produce a postnatal assessment for the uh, venous thromboembolism uh, uh, risk assessment. And again, because of the risk of VTE in postpartum is really high, so they make it, if the patient got two or more risk factors, she needs and immediately a thromboprophylaxis to cover the postpartum period. So this is the, uh, the risk assessment tool that is present in the Royal College guidelines. When I said about the Royal College, why I am following the Royal College? So the, Royal, the majority of our ob department in, 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 the, in Kuwait who are following the guidelines of the Royal College in managing many cases on, in obstetrics and gynecology. That's why we are adopting the Royal College uh, guidelines. So once the Royal College put 
the, uh, the BTE risk assessment tool, they provide us with the prevention plan. So according to the score, we will provide the thromboprophylaxis. So what we did, uh, what we did as uh, uh, OB-GYNE uh, consultant in uh, Farwani uh, hospitals, we have a chat with the OB-GYNE council and we decided to have to move forward in uh, preventions of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy and during the postpartum period. So we decided to make a journal club and our main uh, topics in journal a club uh, is uh, preventions of venous thromboembolism. So our first journal club uh, done uh, in uh, uh, 2019, organized by Al-Adan Hospital under the name of Improving VTE Thromboprophylaxis Management. And during that time, we sat together and arranged what we should do as a risk assessment uh, tool uh, to prevent VTE in pregnancy and postpartum. After that, uh, we stopped during the COVID era, and then uh, last year we started our second ob club organized by Farwania Hospital under the name VTE Safety Zone in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And during that time, we already established our risk assessment tool to prevent venous thromboembolism in pregnancy and in postpartum period. And that's our risk assessment tool uh, approved by the Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, Council in Kuwait. And that's what we are advising now all the uh, obstetricians and gynecologists to be uh, followed in their uh, current uh, practice. So let's talk in details about this risk assessment uh, uh, tool, and that's what we are doing currently in Farwania Hospital and <coughs> in uh, other ob department uh, in, uh, in Kuwait. So let's take it in details. And this risk assessment tool, it is adopted from the Royal College uh, uh, guidelines. So we have pre-existing risk factors, and according to the risk factor, we give the score of uh, uh, venous thromboembolism. For example, if the lady, she got a previous VTE, except a single event related to major surgery, we give her a score of four. Score of four, it means high risk of VTE. So she needs to be given a thromboprophylaxis immediately after the, uh, uh, the scoring. Uh, then we are categorizing according to the uh, if she got a previous VTE that is provoked by major surgery, we give her a score of three. If she's known high risk of thrombophilia, we give her again a score of three. If she got any medical comorbidities like uh, heart failure, active systemic lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, diabetes type one, sickle cell disease, then she needs to be scored as three. If she got family history of unprovoked or estrogen-related VTE in first degree relative, she will be scoring one. If she's a low risk of thrombophilia without VTE, she will be scored one. And then we uh, check her age, obesity status, parity, and the smoking. Each of one will be scored one, except if she got a body mass index of more than 40, that's her score will be increased to two because the risk of VTE among those group of people is really high. So the obstetric risk factors, again, according to the risk factors, we will give the score. If she have a cesarean section in labor, that means emergency cesarean section. We will give her a score of two because she's at higher risk of VTE. Elective cesarean section, we usually label her, score her as one. If she got preeclampsia in the current pregnancy, that's additional uh, one score for the VTE. There are uh, some of the risk factors that's uh, uh, like multiple pregnancy, or if we are using an operative vaginal deliveries, again, the score will be uh, uh, one. 
The transient risk factor, which are the temporary risk factors, some of those factors that apparent only during the first trimester, uh, uh, especially hyperemesis gravidarum, patients might, might be uh, affected with the severe dehydration. So those risk factors will be a transient for a certain period of time. We labeled her, uh, uh, we gave her a higher score of VTA. If the patient got ovarian hyperstimulations or if she went into uh, uh, an artificial reproductive techniques and IVF uh, uh, procedures, then she will be a very high risk of VTA. Majority of those patients will be prescribed thromboprophylaxis during the procedures of the uh, IVF. If the patients got uh, a uh, history of a uh, prolonged uh, uh, journey, uh, then she will be having, this is really considered as a transient risk factor, should be taken into consideration. And at the end, we will get the score of her uh, uh, VTE score, and accordingly, we will uh, act. So if the total score is four and more antenatally, then she needs a thromboprophylaxis immediately after the scoring. If she got a scoring three antenatally, then we might consider a thromboprophylaxis from 28 uh, weeks pregnancy. If the score is two or more postnatally, then the risk of VT is high. So she needs to be given a thromboprophylaxis at least for 10 days. Any admission to the hospital antenatally, that will be considered an additional risk factor. So the prophylaxis we are used in, uh, uh, I think that's explained by our colleagues early. We have either mechanical thromboprophylaxis or pharmacological um, uh, thromboprophylaxis and the prophylactic uh, drugs we are using that uh, um, the majority we are using now in Exobarium. And before we prescribe the uh, thromboprophylaxis, we have to make sure of exclusions of contraindications to give the women the uh, thromboprophylaxis. So that's the documented VTE risk assessment uh, uh, sheet we are using currently in Farwani uh, uh, Hospital. That's in our uh, system uh, for all patients during antenatal care and during each admission and uh, during the postpartum uh, period. So once we identify the risk factor, we need to monitor and reassess this risk at each visit and at each admission. So all pregnant and postpartum women must undergo documented VTE risk assessment during first antenatal booking, during admission in non-obstetric setting, intrapartum and immediately postpartum. Those with the low risk, we are happy with encourage mobilizations, and I am glad that I am implementing an early mobilizations after uh, operative uh, deliveries. Within six hours after uh, operative deliveries, the patients need to be uh, ambulated and adequate hydration, and we might consider the graduate compression stockings or intermittent calf compressors. Patient education is a must. We have to alert the patients what are the signs and symptoms of VTE, and we have to explain that the risk of VTE in pregnancy and postpartum is really high. Again, once we decide that the patient is intermediate or high risk, we have to exclude the contraindication of the thromboprophylaxis. Our main contraindications that worrying us as an obstetrician and gynecology if the patients have an active uh, uh, bleeding. So what we are using as a thromboprophylaxis, this is the low molecular weight. Heparin is the agent of choice. It's uh, the dose is just based on patient weight, do not need monitoring, and it is safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. The unfractionated heparin, we keep this an option for a high risk of thrombosis and bleeding and require monitoring to the platelet count every two to three days from day four to day 14. It's a short acting drug and its effect can be reversed by portamine sulfate. Warfarin, 
can be used postpartum because we cannot use it in, during the antenatal period because of the fetal teratogenicity. So warfarin, it is, uh, uh, can be used postpartum if there is a risk, uh, once the risk of hemorrhage is reduced, usually five to seven days after delivery, if the woman is at higher risk of a thrombosis. It requires a dose monitoring and it is safe in breastfeeding. But it is not an appropriate option for a patient who requires a thromboprophylaxis for 10 days. Any high risk woman requires to continue thromboprophylaxis for six weeks. Any intermediate risk should be uh, uh, continue to have a thromboprophylaxis for 10 days. We are lucky to have our quality uh, uh, department in Farwania Hospital, which are, they are keeping us. Uh, pushing us toward uh, implementing uh, uh, the VTE risk assessment tool and also to update our policies, guidelines, how to manage or how to reduce VTE in pregnancy and postpartum. So that's our policy in Farwania Hospital, which is updated every two uh, years. Or if there is any changes or the update in worldwide, we might make an earlier uh, update. Quickly, I will go through our departmental guidelines that a patient, if she is on low molecular weight antenatally and if she experienced any vaginal bleedings or if labor started, should not inject herself with the low molecular weight. If she is booked for an elective caesarean section, she should to omit her first morning uh, uh, dose. And uh, if regional anesthesia uh, uh, should be avoided, if possible, until 12 hours after the last prophylactic dose of low molecular weight and 24 hours from the last therapeutic dose. And uh, uh, low molecular weight should not be given for four hours after use of the spinal uh, uh, analgesia. And uh, when women present while on a therapeutic uh, treatment with low molecular weight, regional techniques should be avoided at least 24 hours. And the first thromboprophylaxis should be started as soon as after delivery once there is a no risk of vaginal uh, bleeding. So women at risk of hemorrhage with risk factors can be managed with the anti-embolism stockings, foot embolsivices, devices, and unfractionated heparin might be used for those at high risk and there is an, a risk of bleeding. If a woman develops hemorrhagic problems while she's on low molecular weight, then treatment should be stopped and we ask help from our colleagues, the hematologist. So women delivered by elective C-section, she had at least double the postpartum risk of VTE compared to vaginal birth. The risk of BT, uh, VTE after an emergency C-section is twice as that in elective C-section and four times after uh, vaginal deliveries. So those women should be covered by a low molecular weight for 10 days after delivery. Just to, uh, I will share with you, this is the last minute, uh, Victor, I promise. I share with you the total deliveries in Farwania Hospital last year. It's about 4,000 deliveries last year we had in Farwania Hospital. 58% was spontaneous vaginal deliveries and 40% cesarean section. And among those 40%, 38% were emergency caesarean section and 62 elective caesarean section. And out of those deliveries, the number of patients who really had an antenatal care in our hospital are 55%. So we are missing half of our patients who delivered with us. Those patients were not been uh, uh, undergone the risk assessment uh, for the uh, VTE. So what I believe now that since the majority of our deliveries uh, in our hospital, we can prevent the VTE postpartum, but during antenatal period, I think we need to work hard and that can be achieved by patient education. Patient education is a must. It is vital to encourage the women that there are risk factors of VTE in pregnancy and postpartum and she needs to be alerted about the signs and symptoms of VTE and when to start the VTE and the correct use of VTE and how patient can reduce the risk of VTE. 
Before discharge, patients should be aware and uh, uh, cleared about and uh, the signs and symptoms of DVT and the recommended uh, duration of use and make sure they are continuing their management uh, uh, plan. So, since we are in March, and I believe March is the blood clot awareness month, so this time dedicated for raising the awareness of blood clot. My message to all women who were pregnant or expecting a baby or who had recently a baby, you are at risk of blood clot. So don't let the blood clot spoil your joy. The good news, it is preventable. How we do that? By taking the steps further to educate yourself about the VTE risk factors and ask help when it's needed. So I will conclude with uh, two lines. VTE is highly preventable. Patient education for VTE risk during the pregnancy and after delivery plays an important role in prevention. Thank you, and I'm happy to receive any questions. Thank you, Dr. Amel. Just to clarify one point, when you talk about BMI, we are talking about pre-gestational BMI, because BMI, we cannot check it during pregnancy. Yes, sure, pre-gestational, that's a pre-existing risk factors, this body mass index, patient attending antenatal, or any admissions, we, we already record her body mass index, uh, and uh, from that, we'll take her risk of uh, venous thromboembolism.